Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our latest productivity talk, organized by the Asian Productivity Organization. This is Paul Chait Kropperyun, and I'm with the Public Sector Division of the APO. We are streaming live from Tokyo, Japan. Today's topic of discussion is a timely one. The title of the talk is Using Strategic Foresight for Anticipatory Risk Management. The COVID-19 crisis, which began in the People's Republic of China, has hit the rest of the world with full force. We are witnessing closed schools and universities, closed shops and museums, and empty streets. International tourism and parts of production have come to a halt. Economists agree that the crisis will have far-reaching effects on the global economy. Today, what is essential for organizations and individuals is to find ways to manage risk and to manage uncertainty so that they can maintain business continuity and continue to operate and deliver key services. Strategic foresight, the subject of our talk today, is a set of techniques and frameworks that may be helpful in this regard. In this APO productivity talk, Marcus Barber will present the principles behind using foresight for risk management with attention to real life cases and practical examples. To share his knowledge and views on this issue, we are honored to have Mr. Marcus Barber from Australia here speaking today. Working with executive and leadership groups, his work is primarily in identifying emerging issues and future operating conditions and has been, this work has been utilized by corporations, nonprofit entities, and government agencies nationally and around the world. Uh, he's advised and trained hundreds of manufacturing man managers across the greater southeast of Melbourne over the past 15 years. He has international multi-sector experience with Victorian Police, Central Highlands Water, Fosters, the Department of Defense, General Motors, the FBI, Hilton Manufacturing, and of course with the APO. Thank you for joining us today, Marcus. Before you begin, uh, I'd like to note that today's session will be interactive. So if anyone is currently watching and would like to ask any questions or make any comments, please leave them in the live chat. Uh, Marcus, would you would you like to start? Indeed. Uh, thank you, Paul Chait, and uh, welcome, everyone. It's great to see uh, so many familiar names in the uh, chat room. Thank you for saying hi. I haven't been able to say hi to all of you individually whilst I've been waiting. Uh, I feel very honoured to have been asked to come and, and share some thoughts with you on the idea of strategic foresight and risk management. Uh, I know some of you have seen me speak before and uh, I'm normally very fast and fast paced. It's a bit more difficult for me this time because uh, I like to walk around and go and talk to people and ask questions. So we're going to try and enable that as well. Um, I'd really encourage you during the next hour or so, if you have a question, ask it straight away in the chat line. Your question will prompt me, it will prompt Polchate, it will prompt others to think about things. So we'll talk about uh, how strategic foresight lines up with the idea of risk management uh, and continuity planning, uh, and we'll connect some of those dots. And I'll bring a couple of uh, uh, real life case studies in as well. So let's start the slideshow and, and uh, good luck everyone. Um, remember, keep asking those questions in the chat line as we go along. So we're gonna have a look at uh, this idea of strategic foresight, uh, anticipating risk management and what we mean by anticipatory risk management is getting ahead of the curve, not waiting until an event is happening, but thinking in advance of potential outcomes that might emerge. Those outcomes can be good or bad. The idea of risk typically is this challenging space that tends to have a negative connotation. It doesn't have to be, but that is often how it's framed. And you'll see in the subsequent slides uh, how that all pans out over time. The next slide, please. So just to give you a bit of an idea of what I do, those who haven't seen me before, I say there I play the court jester role. My main job is to try and help organisations to think about the world around them. What is their industry sector going to look like? What is their department going to be required to do? What skill sets will be needed? What capabilities will we need at hand? And what are some of the emerging issues that might change our views? Because it's it's that concept of, of things changing shape over time that lead us to make strategic choices. In the space of risk management, my idea is to try and help provoke whether or not your assumptions about the future are valid and therefore whether your expectations for the future are realistic. And in that, what we're trying to do is provoke, you know, sort of prime provoke 
your thinking as effectively as we can. Next slide, please. So the seeds of your destruction lie in the forests of your successes. We are really successful species at doing the same thing consistently over time. And generally, we're pretty good at it. The trouble is, once we get successful as a department, uh, as a company, as a society, as a country, the tendency is we just sit back, put our hands up and relax a little bit. And what that means is the things that have brought us as far as we have successfully in scattered amongst that forest. There are these seeds that are lying for the opportunity to sprout into something that changes the face of what you are, that puts a disrupt in your forward view. And so you have to be mindful that even though you've been successful, that does not mean what has brought you so far is going to help you into the future. You have to be looking for those seeds that might give sprout to ideas that challenge what you do. Next slide. So when I work with an organisation as part of my thinking, what I'm trying to do is work with them and identify how is it that they think about the future? What are they trying to achieve? And what are some of the challenges they might face? So this equation is a way for me to, in my head, have that conversation with senior management or a particular team inside a department and say, how are they looking at the challenge of what it is they're asked to do? So here we see the A and E line, the future end, the, the number of futures, the assumptions. The A stands for assumptions. What assumptions have you made based on the information you have available to you. And therefore, based on those assumptions, what expectations do you have for the future? I want to know whether or not your assumptions are valid. If you haven't looked deeply enough, if you haven't questioned what you understand to be possible, there's a fair chance those assumptions will not be valid. And that increases your risk profile. The same with the expectations. Are your expectations realistic? That's up for you to make. But if you are claiming that you can get to the moon next week and you don't even have a rocket station built or plans, your expectations aren't realistic. So what we try and do is, is get our organisations to do the breadth, depth and distance. We want to take your blink you can look left and right to be able to understand that around you there are things happening that maybe you're not paying attention to. The busier you are, the more pressure you're under, the more likely it is that your blinkers, your view of the world, will develop a tunnel. That increases your risk. We want to get depth in our thinking. When we look at a particular issue, at pieces of information, we want to understand whether or not we are peeling off the layers, like an onion. Are we looking at the surface of the issue or are we getting into the heart of the matter? So we want to try and increase the depth. And finally, from as a futures point of view, I'm biased, so I flag my bias. I like to look ahead a bit further. I don't want to be looking here in the instantaneous here and now. I want you to look further ahead. Do we need to look two years, five, 10, 20 years ahead for countries? Is it 30, 50, or 100 year time spans? That's a decision you have to make for yourself. So that formula helps me have that conversation with managers and I can work out how they're thinking about the world and where they've got increased areas of risk. Check your assumptions, check your expectations, expand your breadth, dig deeper with depth and look further ahead in distance. That narrows the possibilities that are available to you. Next slide. Okay, so just some clarification. We're talking about strategic foresight, risk management and continuity planning. Just some labels up there. So the strategic foresight scanning ahead. The risk management is looking for those areas that might often cause us negative impact. Remember, not all risks are negative. Opportunities are a form of risk. If you have to change what you're doing, if you have put resources to take advantage of an opportunity, that's also a risk. But typically, risk management seems to be things that are going to be bad for us as opposed to all opportunities. But it can be bad or, or good, typically. And the continuity planning. What is it that you need available to you to make sure that if something happens, you can actually continue as an organisation, as a department, as a person? 
So this is if you are from a personal level, let's say you, you're going to go uh, traveling somewhere, what are the key things you need that no matter what, if you get disrupted, you should be able to continue your journey? That's what we're talking about, continuity planning. And continuity of planning applies to organizations and countries. What is it that you need? What skills and capabilities must be available to ensure that you as a company or as an organization, as a country, can continue unimpeded? Thank you. Next slide. Right, so what we're really talking about here are these three domains. The idea of biology, what are the risks that impact me personally from a, the way I'm put together as skin, flesh and bone. The, the idea of psychology, what are the risks that impact the way I think about the world, my mental health, my levels of stress, my comfort with change. And then sociology, we are a social creature. Um, how do we come and fit together and work together? What's been fantastic during the pandemic, this COVID-19 pandemic, is despite what some people have said that when, when risks, people are all for themselves, the fact is around the world, time and time again, people have gone out of their way to help. So some of the fundamental assumptions people have made that everyone's in it for themselves has just turned out to be completely untrue. So your preference for your risk whether you pay attention to those three domains, biology, psychology, or sociology, will determine the type of factors that will come back, those seeds of destruction that will surprise you because you're only going to be looking one or two domains. It's going to be the third domain that will probably catch you out. Next slide, please. Okay, so the idea here from a wildcards perspective, and we'll talk a little bit about wildcards across those three domains. John Peterson out of the Arlington Institute, a very clever guy, wrote a book called Out of the Blue. I can highly recommend it. It's an easy book to read, talks about the concept of wildcards, refers to them as low probability. You know, that will never happen. Low probability, high impact. If that happened, that's going to hurt us low probability, high impact events that if they happen will disrupt the human condition. In other words, our ability to live, to survive, to get on with life is suddenly disrupted. So the idea of wildcards, keep that in mind. We're going to come back to wildcards later in this chat. It's about the idea of thinking that what are those surprise events? So I'm going to pose a question to you now, and I'd like you to put your answer in the live comments, please. Even though I'm going to talk about this slide, but I'm going to ask it now. Um, do you think the current pandemic, the current COVID-19 pandemic, is a wildcard event, yes or no? So there's the definition of wildcards, low probability, high impact event. I want you to type into the comment section, do you think that the current COVID-19 pandemic is a wildcard event, yes or no? You can type away and I'll watch as that feed you. Feed unfolds. Next slide, please. So we talk about uh, the idea of three sites. Hindsight, uh, 2020 hindsight, looking behind us, looking at history, and a little bit tongue-in-cheek here, often we can explain why, why we um, got things wrong or got things right. So that's one of the challenges with hindsight. We, we get the lesson after the impact has arrived. In risk management, that's going to be a problem for us because sometimes the levels of risk are so overwhelming, we cannot make the choices to get through the day. It becomes everything fundamentally becomes a problem for us. The idea of foresight is can we look ahead? Can we, can we consider out there ahead of us what might be coming? And then insight really comes from our ability to combine that hindsight element and that insight element saying, what does history and the future tell us? We have to be able to pay attention to those. So that's a really good uh, line of thinking. When you're talking to people, often they will give you clues about where they are focused. If they're talking about history, oh, that happened in the past and we can't do that because we've tried that before, they're stuck in hindsight. If all they can do is think about, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if the future was like this? Or wouldn't it be disastrous if this happened? They're thinking about the future. And what we want to try and do is combine those. You get lessons from both lines. It's great to see that um, in the 
in the chat list. A lot of you saying yes, that that pan current COVID-19 is a wild card event. Low probability, that will never happen. High impact event. Low probability, high impact. So I'm going to address that a little bit later on. Keep answering if you think it is yes or no. Next slide, please. Okay, so from a strategic foresight point of view, you can see that what we're trying to do is, and I mentioned this early on, what we're trying to do is remove those blinkers. The, the tighter those blinkers are, the more limited our vision ahead is because what we know is as we expand and take those blinkers, the more we become aware of what's going on around us. It's critical for us to be able to ensure that we take those blinkers off. And what we want to be able to do from a, a timing point of view is uh, gain the type of insights using a series of tools. I say there that for most events that happen to us as humans, it's almost impossible, almost, not quite, but to say we didn't know. Now, I'm going to come to the wild card event, that wild card question about the pandemic in a second. It is impossible to say we could not have known. Uh, I was on a uh, conference call recently where uh, one of Australia's ambassadors called the COVID-19 a black swan event. Hands up if you've heard of black swans. Um, I know the few hands would have gone up and it's hard for me to tell. So um, Nicholas Taylor's version of a black swan is that people only ever knew that every swan in the world was white swans until they came down to Australia and discovered that there was a thing called a black swan and their world changed. Now, here's the thing. Did black swans exist before they knew about them? Answer, yes. So Taylor's model of the idea of black swans as wildcard events doesn't work. It doesn't work because just because you were ignorant of the existence of black swans, that doesn't mean it's a black swan event that it never existed before, that it was a complete surprise. You just weren't aware. So here's the other question. You don't need to answer it in the frame. We're getting lots of yeses about this idea of COVID-19 was a wild card. Low probability, high impact. So let's look at it. Is it having a high impact? Absolutely. All around the world, um, from the personal scale to the family scale, to social, you know, little small societies and suburbs, to whole cities and countries, it's having a massive impact around the world. Was it a low probability event? No. The answer is no, it was not a low probability event because we have seen around the world cases of COVID style SARS, MERS and others diseases gaining a foothold and expanding. We've had scientists, places like the CDC in the United States, who and others who've been tracking diseases for a long time, telling us the idea of a pandemic coming to hurt us at a global scale is becoming increasingly likely. In other words, the current COVID-19 pandemic is not a wild card event low probability, high impact. It was known probability, high impact. In other words, if we chose to, we could have avoided or minimised some of the risk. We, as a society, as a species, as countries around the world, chose to ignore it. The idea of strategic foresight, anticipatory risk, is to look at factors that make us uncomfortable. How do you get the right to be right? One of the challenges we have from a conversation point of view is to be able to, inside our organisations, give people permission to tell us something different. Strategic foresight is aimed at trying to expand our views, to look for multiple options for as long as we possibly can. For it to be beneficial to risk management, anticipatory risk, on continuity planning, how do we continue to benefit from strategic foresight? We need to give people permission to tell us what's actually going on. So be very careful about thinking that just because you didn't know, it was a surprise and therefore it was a wild card. Not true. 
We've known for a long time the pandemics are likely, and we also have known for a long time that other things that have happened around the world, both from a geological point of view, if we think of the ring of fire that runs up through Indonesia, up through Sri Lanka, we know the implications that's having. We've known earthquakes in New Zealand. We know droughts and fires in Australia. We know droughts and food things, issues all around the world. We have to be careful about thinking that automatically a wildcard event simply because we had ignored them. They're not the same. They're not the same. So strategic foresight, we want to keep looking and then telling people, hey, we're seeing things. I don't know what it means yet, but if it increases, it's going to have an impact on our risk profile. We need to take action now. Next slide, please. Okay, so what I've got here is this idea of disrupting our sleep. Strategic foresight is really good at disrupting the way we sleep. If you are successful and everything's working for you and your organisation is happy, your company is happy, your department, your country is happy and you are sleeping well, good quality foresight tools will start to give you bad dreams because they will alert you to problems. What if? What if this happened? What if that happened? What if this emerged? What if that stopped? What if this started? The idea of strategic foresight is to disrupt our sleep. That's what it's really good at doing. And I know it sounds kind of strange. I spend probably 70% of my day researching items from around the world, talking to companies about their industry sectors, talking to government departments. What we want to be able to do is take these tools, environmental scanning. Uh, I've got one model of environmental scanning up there, the V-Steep model. Um, those who have been through the APO program would have remembered we talk about that pretty much in every session. Wild cards, low probability, high impact. The cascading discontinuity set there are these small little bites. First that happens, only minor. Then something else happens, only minor. Something else happens, only minor. Something else happens and all these little, little something bites at the system eventually overwhelm you. It's like um, an, an ant's nest eating an elephant. To start off with, there's no, there's no issues, but eventually all those bites will bring the system down. It's a cascading discontinuity set. Scenarios, stories about the future, exploring challenges. What we're trying to do is, is develop the way we can carry the message of the future into the now. That's what scenarios are really good at doing. There's different ways of doing scenarios. Causal aid analysis really asks who wins, who loses, who is doing the same. Fantastic tool. Carter, connect anything to anything, and the CDA. Again, with CDA, we're using our ability to deliberately find alternative voices. What confirms our view? What disconfirms our view? In other words, someone saying the opposite. And what's the alternative? If someone's saying something completely unrelated, but somehow fits in this conversation as well. Systems maps, value systems, there's you know, 40, 50, 60 different foresight tools that are in there. All of them can be used to help you with your risk planning. So the idea of strategic foresight is to anticipate emerging issues and challenges ahead of when they're required. That's what we're trying to get to the whole way through. Next slide, please. Okay, so... Here's the next question for you. Next question. If there's something you really wanted to know, like you only get one question and you can only ask one thing, there's something you really wanted to know about tomorrow, and tomorrow could be three months away, it could be three years away, it could be the next three hours, what would it be? So in the chat window, I'm going to get you to type in there and I'm going to see if I can pick up some of those and maybe answer some of them for you. It's going to watch you and see what happens. And whilst that's going on, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is the uh, emerging issues analysis. This is one of the other tools, one of the many that are available. Remember, we're talking about anticipation, what we perceive that might be possible. So the challenge here is what we what we know for most people they're sort of thinking about taking action at about stage 4A, 4B after today. 
So they discover it today and then they start thinking about some of the challenges. And that's too late. For most things, particularly for risk management, waiting for the event to emerge is just too late. So what we want to try and do and what Paul Wildman and Sahali Niatala identified in this map is we want to start looking at those issues at the level one stage, maybe edging into the level two, the earliest possible signs. And if we talk about can we see the pandemic, so people are saying, uh, can we, will we overcome climate change? Great question coming through there. Um, no. My personal view. We have the answers. We have the technology. We will choose not to do it because we're uncomfortable with change. That's really frightening, but there's a great book I can put you onto. Um, will we, what will be the next normal? That's a great question as well. So if we think about the type of clues, what are we seeing now about the next normal? We're seeing people work from home more often. We're seeing different industries be disrupted. We might not get some of those industries back. We're seeing the idea of travel come. Now, if you are a, a country in Asia and you're really used to the idea of uh, tourism as an income stream, and right now that tourism is locked down hard because of the pandemic. What are you going to do to bring tourism into your country and earn money if people can't fly in? So there's opportunities for tourism operators to think about how do we give people the tools to experience coming to uh, Bangkok and wandering around the city or heading your way down to somewhere in Sri Lanka and maybe wandering through the Indian sun, go to Jaipur and India, any of these places around Asia, what can you do? And we start thinking about, okay, what are we seeing in virtual reality, in haptics technology? Are there ways we can do tourism, making people or giving people access to these sorts of tools to get them engaged. So the next new normal is going to be, how do we live with COVID-19? How do we live with the idea of a pandemic? And so there's another challenge. Jolina Toyota, um, thank you for your question around, will there be another world war? I'm going to say no. I don't know, but we'll see how we go. And I'm going to keep looking at these questions as they pop up. So the idea of emerging issues, just go back one slide if you can, please. Um, the idea of emerging issues analysis is we want to try as a strategic foresight to find those signals at the level one, level two stage, those early signs. Now, that makes them about that big. And by the time the future comes, they might have disappeared altogether. But they might have gotten bigger and bigger and wider and louder. And so we want to try and keep paying attention and keep searching for those clues the whole way through. Next slide, please. Really great questions too I'm seeing in the chat line. I'll, I'll get to as many as I come. Uh, Jasmine Rio, the second coming. Uh, it's a really good question. It's a popular one that I get asked a lot. It depends on your views of the world from a religion point of view and what you choose to believe. I don't have an answer on that one. Um, I, I don't have the insights that, that some others might be able to have, so I'll defer that question to others as well. Virtual tourism, yes, Gerard, I think you're right. That's the type of thing I'm looking at. And you're, you're talking about the idea of digital transformations. How do we combine things like digital technologies into tourism? How do we combine into other aspects? So we're trying to look at a whole range of challenges that might actually be answers to other problems over here. Okay, so risk tolerance frameworks. Uh, what we're seeing here is the idea of a single point future. Governments in particular love single point futures can someone please tell me the future and so what you get is this idea of a, a line a, a, a trend and only one trend perfectly straight no questions about it and so we think we have an understanding because we've looked at one trend concurrent is where you have two or three trends happening at the same time but they're also looked in isolation people don't connect them together the idea of a cumulative risk tolerance framework is that you start to see how the trends stack up on each other and weigh down or push on each other or shift them one way or another. There's multiple things happening. But really, from a society point of view, what we're starting to see is this idea of exponential impacts. And if anything, what COVID-19 as a pandemic has done, it's actually made us aware of just how connected we are around the world. The disease that's impacting in Italy is no different to the disease that's impacting in 
Bangladesh, that's no different from what's happening in Australia, that's no different happening in Papua New Guinea, no different what's happening in the United States. And those connections have had those supply chains of tourism, of manufacturing, of food have been so intertwined that one event happening over here suddenly impacts on all of us. So from a futures point of view, inside your organisation is likely that you will have a tolerance to one particular preferred method of thinking about the idea of risk. From a um, foresight point of view, we want to encourage you to be exponential in your thinking, multiple paths, thinking how they come together. It is likely, however, because of time and inclination, that you'll probably do concurrent, if you're lucky, maybe cumulative, but by and large, not enough organisations do that exponential risk to see how everything starts fitting together. We want to make sure we can expand our view, and that's what some of the strategic foresight tools do. Next slide, please. Okay, so we asked this one, and I'm just going to come back to some of those questions. So just a reminder, low impact, That I'm sorry, low, low probability. It's never going to happen, and then it does. High impact, yes. So low probability, high impact events are, I don't know, a whole new way of... Uh, uh, or a, a species inside a species. So Homo sapiens or Homo sapiens sapiens, the one who knows they know. What if through technology people start implanting chips to give them superhuman intelligence? Will that change the world and therefore make subset of species the whole way through? So we need to have a, a bit of a look in terms of challenges. We know from, from a, a, a reality point of view, when you look at science, We've been tracking the rise of disease for a long, long time. Climate change. Is climate change a wildcard event? No. Why? Because we've had the clues for ages. We have chosen to ignore them. Just because it's a surprise now or things are getting uncomfortable now does not make it a wildcard event. Next slide, please. So on the psychology of risk management, what this slide's looking at are some of the factors that prove as a species we are not very smart. In fact, um, some would say we lack intelligence altogether. And I don't mean you, but I mean the person next to you. Or if not them, someone you know is actually not very smart. And we know this because as a species, we've chosen to ignore the clues so up here, we've known uh, Rachel Carson. Oh, you continue. You continue, you continue. Presentation. You disconnect. You continue. Mm -hmm. So I think we're facing some technical difficulties. So I think uh, we can take this time to uh, write down comments, questions. Uh, some things that Marcus's talk so far has uh, got me thinking about is, for example, what exactly is the role of maybe common sense when thinking about risk? And what is the role of common sense when it comes to using strategic foresight? So obviously, as Marcus was suggesting with the example of uh, CFCs, pollutants, and climate change, uh, some technical or scientific issues are very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult to use our intuition. But for other things that, are, that affect us more day to day, is it appropriate to use common sense? Uh, other questions I ask, uh, myself as I listen to Marcus's talk. Um, I think in many fields there's an effort to quantify risk, to have an understanding of the mathematization of risk. Uh, so one thing I'd like to eventually ask Marcus is, you know, is that the right direction or should we rather treat uh, risk management and foresight as less of a science and less of a, a, a dimension where we can use maths and have uh, you know quantified uh, probability estimates, or should we treat it more as an art and as a matter of interpretation and judgment? Uh, 
I, I also think in terms of uh, the various cultural aspects of risk management, I know that uh, in the public sector, I know in the public sector we have many different cultural moments. Ah, I see Marcus has popped back in. So hopefully I'll, I'll ask these questions to him directly. Uh, Marcus, are you with us? Ah, I think we're back. I think he's back in and now he's outdoors. I am. I'm outdoors. Hi, everyone. I'm changing, Hi, lo I'm changing locations. Let me just get some lighting on. We're trying to anticipate things at the same time. So bear with me for a sec. Yeah, it looks like you've had a wild card event. Uh, look, well, a wild card <laughs> event is, is it something we couldn't anticipate happening? Uh, the answer is from a, uh, a Wi Fi point of view. That's we know true. The we know the Australian government years ago made the choice not to improve the internet connectivity around the world. So no, it's not a wild card event because we could have done better. We could have seen it happening. But either way, so here we have from the psychology of risk management. My apologies, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I've lost all your live comments in the chat, but hopefully I'll pick those up as we go along. Uh, so I've moved to a, a closer location from a Wi-Fi point of view. So um, what we're seeing here from a psychology of risk management is that We've seen these clues the whole way through. That small book down the bottom, the uh, this little one that looks almost like a petrol bowser, it is one of the most frightening books I've ever read when it comes to the idea of people's notion of risk. It's a simple book to read. It explains where we are with regards to carbon and fuel usage and what choices we have, whether we go from coal or not. And we're also seeing that it says we have the solutions readily available to us. And it also explains why we won't act on those solutions. It's a frightening book. It looks at the psychology of humans. Other clues, other clues over there are the idea of things I do with climate change and what we do. Next slide, please. I'm going to show you something that's I find absolutely fascinating. So um, in, in, in this idea of climate, in the idea of pandemics and the way societies work, we have these little trend lines over time, things moving up and down, up and down as things change, and then we get these fundamental breaks in how society works. So what we actually have here is a little, just a little graph that shows how it works. Next slide, please. Thank you. Look at this clue. The, the article on the left from the Otomatatea Times talks about the idea of burning all this carbon and putting it in the atmosphere when combined with oxygen creates tons and tons of atmosphere that is likely to warm up the earth. That article of science was written in 1912. 1912. The, the article on Ehrlich was written around 1970. So let me see and ask you, how much time do we need to take the kind of action that we should to improve and improve our lot in life and minimise the risk factor? Do we need 100 years, more than 100 years? At some point, we'll have to say, you know what, it's going to be uncomfortable to change, but our choice and the risk profile of if we don't is actually getting to the point where continuity the idea of how do we continue a society is going to fall apart because the risks related to science, the science is telling us in terms of food production, in terms of transport, in, in terms of water, is going to become increasingly problematic the whole way through. So what we want to try and do is start using strategic foresight and scenarios and narratives and stories that can help us shift the way we view the world. Next slide, please. So that's that, other, that's that other issue of how things change over time. We sometimes think that small incremental improvements are going to be enough. We like the fact that we improve maybe the fuel efficiency of our cars or that our computers get a little bit quicker or that maybe our lighting gets a little bit more efficient. Unfortunately, all those little successes become that forest among which the seeds of destruction lie. And eventually... No matter what we do, sooner or later, we hit that chasm and in we go. We hit the graveyard. Whole technologies, whole ways of doing things, whole societies have disappeared 
almost overnight, not always, but almost overnight because we've ignored the issues of change. It's that lily pond, um, lilies in the pond metaphor where at, you know, at half growth because it doubles every night, the following day things have changed fundamentally. So what we're trying to do is find our thinking from a strategic risk point of view to be able to leap that chasm. Can we get beyond so that we don't fall into the graveyard? Next slide, please. Okay, so risk and strategic foresight. That's uh, my apologies for that formatting of that particular slide. Um, the challenge here is what we're trying to do is link the notion of risk, both opportunity and um, threat, the idea of negativity and strategic foresight. Next slide, please. And this one will be probably a little bit, yes, it will. So some questions to ask. What would we need to be looking for to tell us that this is becoming more or less likely is in response to this question. How does this person, how does this uh, department or this company, how does this society work? And what would cut its legs off? So when I think about the idea of risk and anticipatory risk management, what I'm looking for is the essence of how a country works. What does it rely on to get through its day? Uh, if I talked about Singapore and its excellent IT connectivity, if you took that IT connectivity away, given all its systems rely on that connectivity, does it still function effectively as a society? I don't know what risk management they've got in play. I suspect they will have series of redundancies. But if you rely on one product for all of your sales or one service for all of your all of your income if you're a company, or if you rely on government handouts if you're a not-for-profit, or if you rely on one customer to give you the majority of your revenue, that then increases your risk if that is suddenly taken away from you. So in terms of what would prevent us from functioning and what would we look for in terms of signals of change over time to tell us that that risk was de increasing or decreasing and then what should we do as a result is how you connect this idea of strategic foresight to take those blinkers off, to get depth and distance and to look further ahead. And so we do that and try and say, what actions do we need to take? This is the key thing. Strategic foresight is not a theoretical exercise. It's about taking pragmatic steps today. Next slide, please. So this idea there of, of jumping the chasm, that's what we're trying to do. Strategic foresight, yes, it can disturb your sleep when you do it well. And I, look, I would love to hear your stories of bad nightmares and dreams when you're doing using these tools. What was it that kept you awake at night because suddenly you had some new learnings available to you? Um, it helps give you some stability. If you set a vision for your organisation, you set a vision for your country, what do we want to be? What do we want to become? and that vision is held collectively by everyone, that vision will pull you forward even when things are dragging you left and right. We want to be able to use strategic foresight to do that. And also, just in case your things are a little bit calm and relaxed, it will tell you where surprise might come. Yes, it's a nice, even flow, but are you about to fall off the waterfall? Strategic foresight helps you pay attention to those things. Next slide, please. Good observation there about needing data. I think that's excellent as well, yes. So um, some similarities of risk in general uncertainty. I'm going to oh, – uh, Jolena, I'm going to come to that a little bit, I think, in the next couple of slides. Hopefully I'll answer your question there as well. So what we're trying to do is link history, how have we um, evolved over time, the habits of behaviour with the future. That's that hindsight, foresight, insight, connectivity. We're trying to link the two. So you use things like backcasting, connected to your, to your scenarios and your future of world, you've done environmental scanning, you've looked wide, you've peeled off the layers, you've looked further ahead, that breadth, depth, distance, you've connected it to the strategic plan. What will we do? What will we do? You have to be able to connect it to actions for today. Put that in your, in your plan, decide, then start and monitor your progress. If things are turning left, make your adjustment. If things are turning right, make adjustment. It's a constant swing towards the future. It's very rarely one track. Next slide, please. So just a note for a lot of organisations, uh, a lot of governments, maybe not your government or not your department, but some you probably know, have this idea of an operational, what I call an operational shadow. 
The yellow box is where they are focused, tightly focused. This is why we exist. We're here to do roads or we're here to provoke, um, to help promote and grow industry, the productivity element. We're here to look after people, whatever it happens to be, but that tight focus. But behind it sits this shadow, much bigger, much darker. Next slide, please. Inside that shadow is where strategy and risk emerges. I've jotted down some of those things that look to clues of a future emerging. It, strategic foresight is not, not, not about prediction. It's about estimation and anticipation. It's about thinking about what could be possible. Um, and so, look, I'll, I'll just pick up um, uh, the MPO's uh, question around the idea of um, techniques to, to foresee before pandemic spreading. So the science was out there looking at it. And inside this space, this operational shadow, there are signs and clues that you can pay attention to. Scientists telling us that a pandemic was likely. Scientists telling us about changing risk profiles and changing methods for which viruses uncover over time. So th there's lots of clues. If you choose to ignore science, that's fine. But don't say you didn't know. Don't say you couldn't have known because the fact is we did know. These are some of the clues that are emerging for us now, virtual reality, technologies, new ways of working together, issues over food supply, the quality of our, quality of our soils, uh, plastics and poisoning our oceans. We don't even have fresh oceans anymore. They're stale and turgid because we keep dumping our rubbish into them. We're not recycling well enough. There's a whole range of things that we've got opportunities to fix to make the world better but we have to choose to pay attention to the signs around us. Next signals, uh, next sign, please. Thank you. Okay, so right now, right now, what would we be doing right now? You know, people talking about the need to be, you know, get some data. Absolutely, data is a key part of it. But you also have to try and find ways to tell the story of what the data means. If all you do is do dry Excel spreadsheets, it's like eating a biscuit without a glass of water and then having another biscuit and another biscuit. Sooner or later, it becomes unpalatable. So the, the scenario is about bringing the story of the data to life so people understand the issues. In risk, you have to be able to tell the story of risk. Here's why this might happen. This is what the world could look like. Here's how a department could act if these sorts of events come together. That's the narrative that carries the future message into the now. So take a breath. I know it's really, for a lot of us, it is just terrible. I'm working from home. We just had a Wi-Fi blackout with the issues of transport. We're not alone. Lots of people have lost their jobs around the world. We've got issues over getting food to and from people. People are sick. People, unfortunately, are dying en masse. It, sound, it just feels busy and big and oh, we have to take a breath. Take a breath and think about, okay, what's the best possible outcome for now? Reframe the issue. What can we learn from things like a pandemic? What could we learn from a series of bushfires? What could we learn from new technology being applied that we can learn other lessons from and improve our current standing? We're trying to reframe everything from being negative to saying, yes, we know it's not great, but what is it that we can take advantage of now to shift the world? There's a lot of conversations around organisations and countries saying, this is the perfect time to shift to renewables because it's we've slowed everything down from a transport point of view, from an aviation perspective. Let's now go all renewable. Let's go all in. The point I make there, stop doing what doesn't matter. These reports that are just, you know, this wide, just massive and so deep, they don't matter. Stop doing what doesn't matter. If you're having meetings for no real purpose, stop doing it. If you're driving somewhere for no purpose, stop doing it. If you're whatever it happens to be, try and work out those things that don't matter and stop doing it because your mind and your energy needs to be put somewhere else. And then sift through the noise. Where are the opportunities in there? Not everything needs your attention right now. Only some of the things do. So try and sift through the noise as best you can. And often that means talking to other people, other experts. Next slide, please. Okay, so building a better path forward, get a vision, think about what it means, build your pathway forward, and then set yourself a target. The idea from strategic foresight in risk and continuity planning is to be able to change how you're currently operating to match what's required now and what's emerging. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so this is the summary slide that we're going to get hopefully a whole heap of questions. Just a reminder, what's made you successful so far might be hiding the reason for your unraveling. You've got to be paying attention. I use that mathematical framework, that formula to try and tell me how people are thinking about the future and therefore how I can help them. Is it their assumptions are invalid because they're not looking at the right information? Are they not looking at the information well enough? Are their expectations unrealistic? Think about the idea across those three domains of risk, biology, psychology, sociology, and what it means. Single point futures, the reliance on trends will expose you to greater risk. You have to think beyond trends. And the idea too is to lift your gaze further ahead out of the operational window. And that will basically improve the way you think about risk and hopefully get you a little bit further ahead of the curve instead of things getting right on top of you before you spot them emerging. I hope that's been a useful 40 or 45 minutes and happy to have some questions now. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, I think we'll We'll get on to the, I think, more exciting for both of us question. Not that your presentation wasn't interesting and exciting, of course, Marcus, but sure. uh, I think it would be great to get some viewer questions. And I think I'd like to start off with uh, a question on our side, the APO side. So obviously, you see in the news kind of the uses of strategic foresight by these big government agencies. I think Singapore is a very prominent example. Finland's sure. a prominent example. What about individuals? What about smaller organizations? What, what, can, what can people kind of do or what actions can they take to start doing strategic foresight, you know, in the next week? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. Yeah, good question, Paul Chat. I think one of the um, first challenges to ask, what information do we look at now that we think is real? And is it sufficient from our strategy uh, and our strategic thinking point of view? If it's not, then it means the information is not sufficient. So take the blinkers off. Where else can we look? Who else can we talk to? to try and get some insights to give us some understanding about what else might be happening that we need to pay attention to. That's the simplest thing. Look at your current sets of data and work out if it's enough to overcome risk profiles. If it's not, you need to change your data sets and improve them. Thank you, Marcus. I think uh, one of the one of the commenters noticed that you had included the, the term backcasting yes. in one of your slides. Uh, would you like to elaborate on backcasting a bit. I think there's some interest. Yeah, sure. So um, the idea of backcasting is to take a future view. And typically from a scenario's perspective, we, we tend to look sort of minimum of 10, 15, 20 years out um, and then work your way in steps in reverse from the future. We take a little step back and think about what's the difference between the little step back to the new future and take another step back. So as opposed to forecasting, which starts today and pushes the future forward towards you, backcasting starts out there and then pulls the future back into you in reverse steps. So um, it, it's a it's a one of the more challenging processes of people because we, we're forward driven as a species, we think tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. To start out there and think the day before tomorrow and the day before the day before tomorrow is very, very difficult to do. But back passing is basically starting at the future first and working your way backwards to today. Right. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, another question from our end is more about the idea of uncertainty is sort of defined as uh, generally, the lack of information, but I think today we can we can both sort of get the sense that the problem isn't a lack of information, but perhaps the lack of the correct correct information, or perhaps uh, an excess or overabundance of information. Sure. So, how exactly can we use strategic foresight to, uh, in your words, kind of sift through this noise? How do yeah. we uh, take into account kind of the anecdotal uh, stories yep. we hear from our neighbors or friends, things we see in the news? Uh, yeah. stats, the endless kind of different statistics we get. Yeah. Uh, how would we, how does your know, foresight practice relate to that? Yeah, sure. So um, really comes down to often how you look at the sense of data. So if you give someone um, uh, your set of data you've been looking at for a long time and you think there's nothing in it and hand it to someone new with new and fresh eyes, they're likely to have a different set of outcomes and understandings of what you did. 
And this is why it's important from a strategic foresight point of view is to expand the range of information. There's a question that keeps popping up here from the idea of uncertainty and low risk probabilities. Um, and I'm going to try and answer it within, in this one, um, Pocha, if I can. So the, the idea with risk in general is that anything is possible. Anything is possible. Everything's a risk and nothing's a risk at the same time. The more expertise you have at, uh, at rock climbing, the, the lower the risk. And so you can take on increasingly difficult terrain. So strategic foresight from a thinking perspective is giving you the opportunity to take on more difficult terrain in your thinking to build that level of expertise. What we're trying to do, everything can be, deep, and there is no future that's guaranteed. Everything is uncertain. But by looking, Looking ahead, we're trying to anticipate what's more likely, not what will be. We're looking at more likely and probabilities. And, and that's where you start expanding the thinking available to the organisation by looking at information differently, not just gathering more information. You know, the, the idea of big data, I find really problematic. We have so much data available to us now, we don't do anything with. It sits in some file or on some cloud server. The purpose of data is to be questioned to see if you can turn it into information and from information into knowledge. You have to be able to question differently and strategic foresight forces you to ask different questions about the information you have. Mm. Right. And another element I thought that was very interesting from your talk was bringing in the idea of storytelling or narrative. Yeah. Uh, I think that's something that distinguishes. We don't usually talk about risk or uncertainty in sure. terms of stories, we, no. we generally expect maybe there's an 80% chance that it's going to rain tomorrow. Uh, you don't usually hear a narrative about it. So I guess, could you could you kind of explain why is storytelling so central in foresight and also what distinguishes between a good story and a bad story? Oh, yeah, good question, Jim. Um, the best stories are the ones that encourage people to buy into it, to believe into what the story is telling them, to understand how the information comes together. Now, remember, for most um, most people aren't in the room and had no chance to develop the narrative. They had no understanding of the information that was used, whether it was questioned well or not. All they have at the end of it is what you hand them in the form of a story. So for those of you who've ever read a really good book or gone to a good movie where you've just been transfixed by the characters and the events that unfolded, that's a good story. In scenarios work, in futures telling, the best you have is to be able to lock people into a view of the world. And it's the narrative, the quality of your storytelling, the song, the dance, the emotions of that data being explained in narrative form that actually helps, gives them sort of like a, a cup holder to, to keep all that content together. Without it, it just slips through their fingers. A really good story helps them understand what the future could look like if events X, Y, Z unfolded over time. Thank you, Marcus. And uh, just as a bit of a follow-up to that, do you think the kinds of stories we're telling or the stories you see in the media about uh, COVID-19, for example, do you think we're telling the right kinds of stories? Oh, look, I, I live in... Um, a Western orientated world with a media that's skewed a particular way. So I, you know, take, please take this with a grain of salt because I don't understand what sort of stories you're getting in the media over here. Um, the main messages that have been pushed so far have been around uh, violence and looting, uh, say from Black Lives Matters, and then people being frustrated that they can't go out and they want to go and get a haircut. What we're not seeing in the media and what we're seeing much more of is people coming together and singing and dancing. The narrative of, in COVID-19's terms, people helping their neighbour, helping their stranger go shopping, keeping in contact, reaching out to each other, asking if you're okay, giving them support in online forums or physically if they can. What has been proven through this pandemic is how good we are as a species of supporting strangers of supporting neighbours, of supporting family. We are really good at coming together and helping each other. And that's the story we're not seeing enough of in the mainstream media. They have a particular view. They think bad news sells. I don't buy into that. I want to look at what are the other narratives we're not hearing about that are equally or more important. And I think the fact that we've come together to help uh, open sourcing uh, medical supplies and send them all around the world 
you know, we've been really good in this pandemic at supporting each other. And uh, here's another question from our viewers, although you, you might disagree with this one. Why did uh, futurists or foresight practitioners, why did they fail to predict COVID-19? Ah, great question. Um, so a couple of things. One, the idea of strategic foresight is not um, to predict the future. It's to anticipate what is possible and what is plausible. We don't do predictions. We leave that to the economists. So um, our job is to try and expand understanding. But if you have a look at the science, if you have a look at um, films and books, there's literally hundreds of them that have spoken about the idea of a pandemic. This is not new information. Back in 2015, Bill Gates even set up and did a talk and said, we're going to get a pandemic. It's going to hurt. So we know when you do futures thinking well, you can see things coming. We saw this coming. Governments, societies chose not to act because they thought the risk was small, and that's their choice. That's neither here good nor bad. They just thought the risk was small. So futurists are what, uh, you know, in the Association of Professional Futurists, of which I'm a member, this has been a conversation for the best part of 12, 13 years. What are the next big risks for society? So it's not new to us. And uh, some other questions. So I think any organization and most individuals are quite uh, either reactive or proactive about thinking about risks managing sure. risks on their lives or their, the how risk affects their organizations. What do you think are the kind of biggest or maybe most common mistakes people make when they're trying to manage risk? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, well, I think the, the, you know, the belief that it will never happen to them, I think is probably the first, first big um, risk. And the other risk is that they know enough about an issue. So some people get a small amount of expertise and think they're an expert when all they've got is just a small amount of expertise, there are others who know more. So from a personal point of view, your risk is always tied to one of those three factors, biology, psychology, sociology. And depending on how comfortable you are or how knowledgeable you are on certain things will determine what your risk profile will be and what you choose to ignore. So remember, I think second or third slide in, I said what you choose to ignore, you choose to tolerate. So from a risk profile on an individual or company level, if there are things you're not paying attention to, it's because you're willing to tolerate the risk. I don't think we should or that we have the capability of covering every possible option. The fact is walking across the street uh, in a busy city comes with risk. Getting in a plane comes with risk. Eating food from some particular outlet comes with risk. We have to be able to tolerate that and live with it. But the more information we have, and the more willing we are to become experts in some areas allows us that expertise in that area to minimise risk in that particular spot. Um, I, think a, I think a few viewers are asking uh, about your view on what exactly will the next normal be like? What will the new world order be like post-COVID? Uh, not, not just to ask you to answer that question, although of course, your, your, your answer to that question will be interesting. But what do you think it is about strategic foresight that uh, allows you to even kind of think about answering that kind of question or providing a set of answers to questions like that? Uh, do you think it's appropriate yeah. to answer questions like that? Or, or is it a, is an opportunity to get them to ask another question? No, I, look, I think from a, um, a futurist point of view, the fact that I spend pretty much most of my day researching stuff around the world gives me a, a greater understanding across a range of factors, but I'm not an expert in any one area. So if I need to see someone about issues to do with petroleum or issues to do with chemistry or issues to do with food transport, I'm going to go and ask the expert and say, listen, I have questions on X, Y, Z, whatever that happens to be. What can you tell me to improve my understanding of an issue? So I don't ever believe that I'm the expert in a particular area. That's not what I do. What I'm trying to do is bring a whole range of information together for government sectors or for companies and say, look, this is the range of stuff I'm seeing happening. It might play out in these particular ways. And if they do, there's an opportunity or a risk there for you. But you make the decision. I'm only giving you the information. So that's one of the challenges, Polchate, is to be able to understand that inside our organisation, we have experts around us often our colleagues who have different views of the world 
or inside different departments inside our organisations, and we don't even talk to them. I, I don't get that. Why wouldn't you go and ask someone and say, you're the expert, tell me what I should know, and then listen to the expert. Just because they give you an answer you don't like, that doesn't mean you ignore them. They're helping you. So that's one of the challenges. We tend to ignore information that's available, and I'm trying to gather as much data as I can to make it possible uh, to give someone a, a good, clearer understanding understanding of what is more likely to happen, not what will happen. And uh, another viewer question for you, although I think we can expand it to be a bit broader. They're asking about, sure. uh, could you integrate something like game theory into formulating scenarios or thinking about strategic yeah. Fortnite? But uh, more generally, can you bring in other kind of frameworks? I think people talk about sometimes uh, the similarities between foresight and design thinking, or you know, yep. a lot of organizations are using agile. So what is, sure. how? easily can foresight be kind of blended in or combined or integrated with? Yeah, great question. Yeah, yeah, great question. So um, thank you for those questions, everyone. I can see them popping up too as well. So a couple of things. Everybody does foresight. If you've ever planned for getting to work tomorrow and what you're going to wear uh, or going on a holiday and what you need to pack and your destination or anything like that, you already understand the idea of foresight, thinking ahead about what might be possible. So you already do foresight. So things like um, design thinking. Design thinking is trying to find one solution that's the best for a particular problem. That's the opposite of strategic foresight. Strategic foresight is trying to expand our understanding before we do the design thinking. So I like design thinking, that, that connection between the two, but you have to do the expansion first before you do the narrowing. Make sure you're clear on things. Things like agile from a team point of view, um, how do you make sharp decisions and maintain flexibility? You need to be alert. In order to be alert, you're doing ongoing environmental scanning, you're doing risk assessments, you're doing profiling of your products, services, your personnel. So the agile is also connected. Strategic foresight isn't a different set of tools that are completely new. Most of you, when you get into some of the strategic force, I tell you, oh, this is like lean, or this is like agile, or this is like design. Yes, they're all connected because the idea of strategic foresight is just to think more expansively and then make the choices from there. I hope that answers a fairly large question. That, that question could go on for about another hour. Uh, I, I have another question for you, Marcus. Uh, based on all of your professional experience with uh, clients across different sectors, across different countries. Uh, one thing I've always been interested in when it comes to risk and uncertainty is the role of culture and risk. Uh, maybe you could comment on uh, what you've observed working well on these different organizations in terms of how, how different organizational cultures affect treatment of risk and maybe if you could give us maybe not too specific of an example or maybe, <laughs> but maybe you could comment on kind of what sure. sectors seem to be better at thinking about risk? For example, is, is yeah. the defense sector good at thinking about risk? Is it uh, uh, finance? Who yeah, who seems to be uh, Who's the best, who's the best at risk? risk? Yeah, who's the yeah. Best? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, gosh. So different organizations, that, that culture issue is a really deep question, uh, Paul Chait. And I want people to understand that sometimes one of the biggest challenges inside an organisation is identifying which personal people have the right to be right. Um, you know, having worked with the APA over the last sort of two and a half years or so in particular and getting to speak to a whole range of people, one of the questions that comes up a lot working with people is how do we get our managers up here to pay attention to what we've discovered? And that's a really interesting, and you know, I, I don't yet have a clear answer on how to do that for each individual group without understanding the management group. But that, that question of who has the right to be right is the immediate area of risk profile for that organisation because if only one person has permission to be right, then 150, 1,000 can never be the one with the answer. So their challenge is trying to create the ways to give the instructional story so that that person who has to be right can be right. And that then ties into the idea of permission. Does your organisation give its people permission to challenge 
the status quo or the thinking of the leadership group. The idea of staff is not just to do tasks. They can be a great asset for prompting the thinking of those making the decisions for the whole organisation or the whole country. So that cultural thing becomes really important. Um, you know, I'm, I'm probably quite lucky that I don't need to uh, agree with any particular client anymore. So they bring me in simply to challenge their thinking. I'm not there to get another role. And if they don't like what I tell them, that doesn't matter because I was, I was brought in as an expert to say, this is what I'm seeing. These are the implications. And they can choose to ignore that or embrace that, and that's up to them. Um, so that question of culture is a really important one. It's probably a bit big for this this forum, but I think if you, if they can take back that those two questions, how do we get people with an answer uh, permission to challenge the upper level thinkers, those that are running the organisation, and identifying who has the right to be right, will tell you a lot about the type of ways you can get challenging information forward to others. Right. I think we'll start winding down soon. Uh, we're a bit past an hour, but I think we have time for, I'll say, two more viewer questions. Sure. Uh, so this one is from Jose Lito Bernardo. Uh, would scenario planning be a handy tool to all those who are planning to do something after the pandemic, given the uncertainty as to when this pandemic will end? So this isn't a question about anticipating the pandemic, yeah, but yeah. Yeah. now that it's happened, is it useful? Is it particularly what useful? Can you do? Yeah. Look, I'm of the view that everything's a learning opportunity. So it, even inside the pandemic, it is. So um, I think scenario planning can be useful, but you'd need to be looking, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years ahead. If you only look at, okay, scenario for the next three years, it's probably not going to change that much. Things we know is international travel is going to stay restricted. Even if they get a virus, um, a way to inoculate that virus, over the next 12 months, that's still going to take two or three years for that to get around the world. The idea of social trust from different countries, people flying in, you know, that makes it hard. But how do you operate inside that environment? These are operational decisions around risk. Are we willing to risk the health of our population? You know, that's the scenario. But 10 or 15 years from now, the question is, what can we learn from the pandemic about how society came together? Where would do we have risks in our supply chain? Where do we identify ways to feed each other, to bring water to different places? How do we hospitalise or treat people? How do we share the resources as a country that can assist us better for next time? So that's where scenario planning might come in quite useful, but you've got to be looking probably 10 or 15 years ahead, not the next 18 months. The next 18 months are probably already fixed in terms of things we need to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, another, the final viewer question. Uh, so this one is uh, asked by Shane. So I think he's reflecting on the idea that the this pandemic has been quite difficult, especially I think the lockdown in terms of uh, entrepreneurs, small and medium sized businesses. So uh, in your view, is it possible for them to uh, start new businesses or maybe pursue new business ideas in the time of the pandemic? Uh, I guess, is strategic foresight able to help you look at risks and opportunities, pros and cons at this kind of scale? Yeah, so um, the, there's two parts to this question. So is strategic foresight useful for looking at uh, opportunities that emerge inside a pandemic? Absolutely. But we would look at trying to predict the pandemic. We would say, what are some types of events that would cause a lockdown of society? So that could be a massive flood, that could be an earthquake, that could be a bushfire, that might be um, uh, a security issue related to war or conflict. There's a range of things that we would look at and say, okay, in that space, what are the opportunities start to emerge? So, for instance, in the COVID-19 space, uh, online on Facebook, there's a group called Open Source COVID-19 medical supplies. We have had literally hundreds of entrepreneurs, uh, backyard companies as well, with running a few 3D printers, suddenly turn the hand at creating medical supplies for everyone. So is it a good time to start a business? This is kind of the second part of that question. Um, it depends on your business. If you were opening a cafe at the moment, maybe not. But if you're opening a delivery service to help cafes get their food to others, Maybe so. It really depends. So entrepreneurship is a very different thing. You're talking about operating in the here and now. 
strategic foresight is trying to look further ahead. So it is possible to use strategic foresight to spot opportunities and risk. It's not necessarily the best tool to use when you're talking about making decisions of a business, but if you are going to create a solution that's immediately helpful now, it's probably as good a time as any. Thank you, Marcus. So this is a final question from our end. Uh, so for people who are have listened to your talk and are interested in learning more about strategic foresight, what resources uh, or people or organizations would you point them to? Sure. So I know the APO is starting a bit of foresight training. So if you're already yeah, a thank member, you for of the APO, us, Marcus. that's right. Well, that's it. let's be. It's there in your backyard, so you can go and tap into them right from the word go. Um, I'm co-founder of the Centre for Australian Foresight. If you're in the area, you can send us an email and ask a few questions. Associations of Professional Futurists to some of the groups. There's plenty of groups within it. If you just went to one of the search engines and typed in um, foresight groups near XYZ country or XYZ city, you're bound to find connection to someone. There's lots of books out there on scenario planning, uh, on strategic planning. Uh, Thinking the Future is one really good book. Uh, Marie Conway's uh, Thinking Futures as an organisation, a lot of free resources available. So if you, even if you typed in free, free strategic foresight tools, you're going to get a lot of information available to you. You don't have to start from scratch. You certainly don't have to have a major budget. Um, as an individual, start reading differently and start asking questions and build those skills around the idea of understanding breadth, depth and distance so that you can improve your assumptions and expectations will be as good as any. But just send Jam an email and uh, no doubt you'll put your email up, Paul Chait, and people can contact the APO about some of the courses you've got coming up as well. Sure. So an hour now has passed. Uh, I'd like to thank the viewers for their engagement. Uh, of course, thank if you, you have any more questions or comments, please leave them under the video on YouTube and we'll try to get back to you actually in, in two weeks' time. I'm sure Marcus will be happy to answer additional Absolutely. questions or if you have suggestions on future topics related to foresight or other things, uh, the APO can set up talks. We try to be responsive. Of course, uh, I'd like to thank Marcus for sharing his time and knowledge with us. You've given us, of course, as always, a lot to think about. Uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to uh, work together with you face-to-face uh, -face soon. No doubt. So it's uh, at some point. At some point. At some point. Uh, yeah. And so thank you ever very much, uh, viewers, for for. Uh, sitting through the talk and being so engaged. Uh, if you'd like to stay updated, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. I hope everyone stays safe, happy, and productive. Thank you. Thanks, all. Bye.